are live with Penguin Talks. Penguin Talks is a project that brings the biggest and the best authors live to schools to talk about the topics that are of importance and relevance to the students. And it's included um, authors ranging from Michelle Obama talking about the importance of education and self-belief to Stormzy talking about the necessity of owning your voice and being able to, to use it to speak out. And today I am delighted to be joined by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm is the author of five best-selling books. These include The Tipping Point, Outliers, Blink, What the Dog Saw, and David and Goliath. He is the host of the podcast Revisionist History and is a staff writer at The New York, sorry, at The New Yorker. Uh, so a little bit, a little bit about Malcolm. He was born in the UK to a Jamaican mother and an English father, now lives in New York. He has such luminaries of his, as his, four of his fans, sorry, his fans, <laughs> Zoom life. Um, his fans include such luminaries as Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey. And the ideas in his books have changed, have literally changed the way millions of people think about the world. So a very big, warm welcome to you, Malcolm. Thank you, that's very sweet. Um, uh, I'm not sure everything you said was warranted, but I'll take it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's lots I wanna get into today um, with you, but I'm gonna start off with your most recent book. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the title behind that. Could you tell me why, why that title and what it means? The title of my most recent book is Talking to Strangers. And um, I, that, that theme of talking to strangers struck me as being um, a, so the, the quintessentially modern problem. That we, you know, if you think of for the overwhelming majority of uh, of our, our life on earth, human beings didn't talk to strangers. They talked to loved ones, family, tribe, tribes, fellow tribes members, I mean, people that they knew intimately. And then all of a sudden in the modern era, they were thrust into situations where they were forced to communicate with people uh, with whom they had almost no history. And in some cases, almost no understanding. Um, and that's a very different problem and a problem that I think we're ill-equipped Ill to deal with. And so the book is just really about why is that, why is it tricky to talk to a stranger and what are the mistakes that you make and what are the kinds of things you can do to correct those mistakes? So in, in the book, you present strategies and ways for overcoming this really unprecedented time that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the... I mean, the impetus for the book was I, I looked around and I was struck by how many of the kind of controversies that were in the news were versions of the same problem, mm -hmm. which is they were talking to strangers problem. So, you know, I, I, the ones I pick in the book, many there, for example, I picked the, um, uh, Amanda, the case of Amanda Knox, right? Huge uh, sort of murder mystery very big in England. Uh, Amanda Knox is a student, an American college student who's uh, doing a year abroad in Italy with, and her roommate, an English college student, is brutally murdered. And Amanda Knox is falsely accused of the murder. Why is she falsely accused? Because the uh, Italian police and the British tabloid press had difficulty interpreting um, her emotions. They, she looked one way and felt another. And they were unable to deal with that. She didn't act the way an innocent person, they thought and they thought an innocent person is supposed to act. Mm -hmm. right? With the result of this young woman who had nothing whatsoever to do with this crime, went to jail for several years. Um, I talk about the case of Bernie Madoff, which is he was the uh, a financier who ran a Ponzi scheme in America, the largest Ponzi scheme in human history, I think 30 or $40 billion. Literally thousands of incredibly sophisticated people gave enormous sums of money to this man 
and he was from the word go, uh, a, a fraud. He was, he was investing a dime of it. But I, you know, and it struck me, I went down the list but over and over again. And what's that problem about? That's a problem of talking to strangers. You meet mm -hmm. someone and you think this man is a financial wizard. This man is trustworthy. This man will take good care of our money. In fact, he is exactly the opposite of all of those things. He is a sociopath. He will not take care of your money. He has, he's the least trustworthy person you ever meet. So how did, how did thousands of sophisticated investors uh, get him so badly wrong? Um, so that, you know, those are the questions the book revolves around that I tell stories about spies and uh, because a spy is a classic example of a talking to strangers problem, right? You, mm -hmm. someone in your organization has loyalties elsewhere and you are fooled. And the amazing thing to me about spies is there's always spies. So you would think, you never ever hear a spy story where, you know, say you, Emma, decide to spy for the Russians. You're working for MI5. You meet with your Russian handler in, you know, Covent Garden. You go back to the office and they grab you, right? They say, aha, we've caught you. That never mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. If you read spy stories, it's always 10 years of spying and then they catch you. Absolutely. The question is, why does it take 10 years to catch Emma if she's already decided to throw in her lot with the Russians? Those are, I think those are all versions of the same problem, which is that our ability to see the truth of people is profoundly impaired. Mm -hmm. We think we're good at it. We're not. We're yeah. profoundly terrible at it, particularly on the, at the extremes. And the issue is why. I think one of the uh, examples that you that you give in the book that is so interesting is the example from Friends and how you can watch an episode of Friends with the volume turned off basically and mm -hmm. still follow what's going on because the characters' faces are so expressive that you don't need to hear what they're saying and that we have a tendency to believe that this is also how real life works, but it's not yeah. a tool. Yeah, this is called the transparency assumption. And um, and we get this, we have this idea in our heads that if someone feels happy, then happiness will be perfectly represented on their face. They will smile and their eyes will light up. That if they feel, if they're surprised, their jaw will drop, their eyes will go wide, their eyebrows will go up, right? We, we think we have this, this kind of notion that everything in your heart is perfectly represented on your face. Mm -hmm. Where do we get that notion? We get that notion, among other places, from watching television, because it's true on television. When you're an actor, that's what you're trained to do. And that's what I did with Friends. I took an episode of Friends, and I had a, uh, someone who's trained in representing human, in, in, the, in, the, in um, studying human faces, I had her go through the episode and describe what's happening on the faces of every character and friends over the course of that episode. And what she discovers is that there isn't a single instance where an emotion is felt by a character and not perfectly represented on, your fa on their face. Mm -hmm. When Ross is dumbfounded, Ross looks dumbfounded. <laughs> when Phoebe is agitated, Phoebe looks agitated, right? Mm -hmm. if, so that's what I mean. You can turn the sound off and you can follow along because it's all there. It's all in their face, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you watch enough Friends, you think, oh, when I'm dumbfounded, I must look dumbfounded. I'll perform it. Yes, but it, that's not the case. Non-actors don't do that. I could be profoundly unhappy right now and you would not know it. Yeah. I could be nervous. Do I look nervous to you? Not in the slightest. Well, I <laughs> but I shouldn't assume. <laughs> you shouldn't yeah. assume. I could be, my heart could be racing. My, you know, I could be yeah. dreading this entire interview and you would never know why, because for many people, not all of us, but many people simply don't represent their emotions in that transparent a fashion. Right? Mm -hmm. um, a few of us do, um, but it also depends on the emotion. Sometimes you might be someone for whom happiness is something you express easily, but um, discomfort is not. Yeah, absolutely. And you said something there, well, you said lots of things that were incredibly interesting, but one thing that I would like to pick up on particularly was earlier on, you were talking about the fact that we've 
not really been in a period in human history before where we're having so many conversations with people that are essentially strangers that are unknown to us. And then you mentioned that television has kind of trained us to have this expectation that we can read somebody, um, that we can read a person's emotions by their by their expression. So do you think yeah. people are particularly... Not, I don't want to say gullible, but do you think it's something that is endemic of this time of mass media? Do you think maybe people previously had less of a belief that you could understand how somebody was feeling internally based on how they were expressing themselves before there was television, before there was mass yeah. media? Is it kind of, is it a reflection of that? Yeah, I do think the ease with which we can get access to people and to, you know, think about this Zoom call. Um, in a previous era, we would have a phone call and the era, era before that, we would write a letter. So mm -hmm. over the past hundred years, we've gone from communicating, you and I would first of all have been communicating only over a great deal of time. And after we had written things that we had thought about very, before we wrote them, right? When one wrote a letter, it took a little while and you thought about what you, felt and meant and wrote it down. That's a case where the possibilities for us getting each other wrong are limited by the fact that we have time to think about what we're doing and time to make sense of what the other is saying. You know, in, in our case, it would be, we could have a conversation that would last for years. People did in the 19th century have your conversations that lasted for years um, through letters. Then there's a telephone. If we were talking on the telephone, I would be blocked from seeing anything going on in your face. Mm -hmm. And so I would be prevented from drawing erroneous conclusions based on your first facial expressions. I would also, I would, by, by the way, if we were talking the telephone, I wouldn't know whether you were, I wouldn't know whether you were uh, white or black. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know whether you were tall or short. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know whether you were attractive or unattractive. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know any. So I would be prevented from making any kind of assumption based on your appearance which is really important because the assumptions we make about people based on their appearance also tend to be profoundly erroneous, right? Yeah. We, if, you were a, if you were six foot four and a man and had a square jaw and a deep voice, I would assume you were a good leader. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense, right? Complete nonsense. <laughs> Absolutely. But when you look at who we elect as leaders, it tends to be tall men with deep voices and mm -hmm. deep thoughts, right? Overwhelmingly over the last couple hundred years. Yeah, so yeah. if we were talking the telephone, I'd still think we had a good shot at um, preventing mistakes in understanding. It's this mode that we're in right now, where I can see you, that's problematic. Yeah. That's because true. I'm all of a sudden gathering all kinds of information that I'm looking at your hair and I'm, and you're looking at my hair, by the I way. I am indeed, I am. <laughs> and feel, you know, fe feeling perhaps a fictive kinship. Yes, that's right. <laughs> right. Certainly. But we are, but I mean, what are the conclusions I can, you can draw about me from my hair and me about you from your hair? They're, I, don't, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's completely irrelevant information. What does it tell us? It tells us nothing. That you, just that you've been cooped up, I've been cooped up in my house for, <laughs> so, right? That's then, actually, and then you can't assume what it's telling the other person either, because that's, that's not actually what your hair was was conveying to me that, that you'd been cooped up. What was my hair conveying to you? What was it conveying to me? Oh gosh, well, I mean, the title of my book is "Don't Touch My Hair." I think, yeah. I think, I think a lot. I think a lot about hair. Uh -huh. um, if I see another person of African descent, you know, with natural hair, mm -hmm. I that sets off not necessarily assumptions because I think about this deeply, but certainly there are a lot of questions that I would like to ask them about their experiences, about the the factors that have influenced their the decisions that they've made and why they choose to wear their hair the way they do, how people respond to them based on how they wear their hair, because I'm sure you've experienced, I certainly have very, very different reactions to me based on, on the style in which my hair is worn. So this is kind of exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, well, this is, brings up an interesting point that, so I think you're using that, that fact. So you have a, because we're on Zoom and we can mm -hmm. see each other, we have a, an additional set of information about each other. So what you're saying is the fact that I can, that my hair is the way it is would prompt you to ask, 
to want to ask a whole series of questions that might not otherwise have occurred to you if we were talking on the phone. Yeah, okay? yeah. That's the appropriate use of information. It says, okay, I'm gonna take, I've been given a picture of Malcolm and I'm gonna use that as the basis for asking a series of other questions. What I'm objecting to and what we do all too often is we don't use additional information as a springboard to discover more about someone. Mm -hmm. We use information as a means to make a conclude to draw a conclusion. Conclusion about them. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is the error. So it's these, it's the haste with which we want to draw conclusions about people that I object to. And that's mm -hmm. when we're confronted with a lot of of um, it's not irrelevant information, it's ambiguous. My hair is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say, I want to find out more. My issue is far too often when confronted with ambiguous information, we don't recognize its ambiguity. So you see someone who is, you know, uh, awkward and stuttering, and you assume that they're, they don't think clearly. Yeah, yeah. Right? As opposed to saying, to talking to them for 10 minutes, relaxing them, drawing them out, and then drawing your conclusion. It's that, it's that tendency to rush, particularly with those we don't know, that's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. what, type of, what types of steps can be over, can, 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 be, can be used to try, and, to, to try and overcome these assumptions that we make based on, based on, the, on, the, on the visual and what we're seeing? Yeah. Well, I would say, suppose that I was uh, interviewing you for a job, I actually have a little, I started a podcast company with my best friend called Pushkin. We hire people now. So I think about this all the time. If you were applying for a job at Pushkin, Mm -hmm. How should we conduct our interview? So I should clearly read your books. Mm -hmm. I should talk to people who know you, mm -hmm. previous employers. Some, but should I, and I should talk to you, but how should I talk to you? Particularly the first time. I think I should not talk to you on Zoom or mm -hmm. in person. I think we should begin by emailing each other. Mm -hmm. And I should, my first, I should, the first time I try and understand who you are, it should be through the purest and simplest form of communication. Let's filter out what you look like, what you sound like, your facial expressions, your affect, any of that. Let's leave that aside. And let me just figure out what you think. Yeah. And the only way to get a clear shot at what you think is to take all the other information away. When I'm satisfied that I understand or at least appreciate or like what you think, then I can go to the next level and I can say, okay, let's talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. Right now, as someone living in America, you know, Americans are famously, um, uh, we find the Eng uh, English voices to be, um, we're overwhelmed by them. We just find them so fantastic. We fall for them every time. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, an enormous unfair advantage because of your accent. That's why it's important for me to start with email so you, you can't, Mess woo me. or seduce with the with 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 yeah. the accent yeah yeah i can't i have to i have to i have to prevent myself from because we hear those of us living in america hear english accents and we just melt and i the first two people i ever hired both had english accents and i realized these <laughs> that you were you you were duped by their their yeah. dulcet tones yeah, we, to be lovely. <laughs> but, you know, we should think about those kinds of things most importantly though uh, it's, it's appearance that's dangerous. It's mm -hmm. how much of our world is structured to, um, uh, uh, to discriminate against those who do not look the way we want people to look. And by, I'm not just talking about, you know, race, I'm talking about, um, any number of factors. I, I once had a fascinating discussion with a dentist about teeth and about how, if your teeth are not kind of modern and and straight and reasonably perfect, it's almost impossible to get a job where you have to deal with the public. People will not hire you. That's so interesting. I think that has different like cultural, that, that, that it exists to varying degrees in different cultures. I think that's very much the case in the States where people yeah. tend to have these impeccable kind of unhuman almost teeth. But then I've been in other parts of the world where that doesn't seem to be, seem to be such a priority. I think yeah. you can probably tell I'm not American from my teeth. 
<laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to jump in uh, here. I need to um, let the, those uh, watching us tell them a little detail that I should have said at the beginning, which is basically the live comment feed is now open for questions. So if you want to start thinking about some questions that you'd like to ask and even start posting them, we will be answering them shortly. If you can't see the space where you need to do that, then just refresh the page and it should be visible that way. Sorry to interrupt in that way. Um, so just, yeah, something I'd like to ask you that I think would be useful for the, well, there's lots of different people watching us, but primarily students who will be um, tuning into this. Just some very practical, some practical questions about, um, about interviewing and interviewing others. How do you think you develop the skill for interviewing other people? Yeah. Well, interviewing, so interviewing is at the heart of when people think about what it means to be a writer, a nonfiction writer, as I, as I am, and someone mm -hmm. who does a podcast, um, they think about the writing part. That's not what I think about. I think about the interviewing part. I think of myself as an interviewer first and a writer second. Everything I do depends on the quality of the um, material I get from my interviews. If my interviews are bad, my writing is bad. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, an, it's a, a hugely crucial skill, something I don't still don't feel that I am um, expert at, but I think there's a couple of general principles that are really important. And that is that um, first is that nearly everyone is interesting. And if they're not interesting, it's your fault as the interviewer, not their fault as the it's a really important notion. And it's not a kind of, I don't say that lightly. I really do think that your job as a interviewer is to find the thing that the person you're talking to uh, cares about or yeah. feels strongly about or is moved by or um, is precious to or something. You have to locate that because it's not always obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, you know, I often... Um, when I'm interviewing someone, um, I, I look for things that, uh, for moments where, or for topics that um, we where that excite them, um, where they where they clearly in the way they talk and in the way they look. And now here's where I am looking at them um, very very closely, but more interested in the way they talk. When people's language gets um, uh, well, everyone manifests this a different way, but when we talk about things that we care about, our language changes. Mm -hmm. And I listen to those language changes and think, oh, this is something that's near and dear to this person. Um, I should ask more questions about that. Um, the other thing is, I- what way does, In what way does the language change when somebody well, I'll is- I'll give you an example. Yeah, that'd be great. I have a friend who's a screenwriter who is, when he, He's normally very, very mellow, laid back, talks sort of slowly and whimsically. When you ask him to comment on a screenplay or a work of fiction, or uh, he suddenly speeds up, gets really excited, and he, uh, he his speech becomes very, very um, rigorous, logical. It's oh. boom, boom, boom. There are yeah. three things wrong with that. That's when you know you have him, right? Mm -hmm. He's he's almost like gone into another gear, a part of his brain where, you know, all of a sudden he is super engaged, super analytical, yeah. you know, that's yeah. gold. So when I, when I hear, when I see him making that transition, I think, oh, that's, you know, if I was interviewing him, yeah, yeah. Say, stay in this gear, let's, this you know, let's- This is the zone, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that further, so, but all of us manifest that in different ways, but you're looking, you're looking for the for the switch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The other thing is, I I try to be as open about people as possible. So um, I don't think it's useful to be skeptical in an interview. You have to let people represent themselves the way they want to be represented, and you can't that... spend a lot of time trying to scrape away at their story. You have to let them tell their story. And do you ever find that challenging if you're speaking, if you're interviewing somebody whose views you might happen to find 
say reprehensible? Uh, no, I like, I had a, in my book, Talking to Strangers, I spent uh, six hours talking to the man who ran the CIA's torture program during, after 9-11. Wow. Um, he was the psychologist who devised all the techniques and supervised some of the most, um, they call them coercive interrogations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent, you know, like I said, six hours in this company. And I didn't, not once did I ever uh, challenge him. Mm -hmm. I never said, I, I think you're a monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, he was well aware that many people would think that. And so simply by letting him, he knew that that was probably in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. But what I, let, what I did is I wanted him to tell his story. I, what, what I was curious about was how does someone who was a trained psychologist um, end up in a prison in Iraq waterboarding somebody? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, and he had an answer to that. He would, if you gave him time and uh, freedom, he would tell you how he ended up there. It took six hours. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I think that uh, at the end of it, he was aware that I, that we disagreed, mm -hmm. but grateful for the opportunity to express himself. Yeah. He hadn't convinced me. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I came away enormously educated about why human beings do things. Um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hate him. Yeah but I felt I understood him in some way. Yeah, absolutely. To bring it um, back to some of the perhaps techniques that the young people watching um, might find useful, if they were, yeah, if they were interviewing people, is there any advice that you could give them that might make them, um, that, that you would, yeah, recommend for a, for a, a, a good interview? Yeah. Um, well, the first one would be patience. So you have to be willing to sit with someone and to come back to them. Um, you're not going to get the full story necessarily the first time you talk to them. And you're not going to get the, a good story in the first uh, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be willing to find the time to kind of, if you think about it, if you think about um, uh, most of us in conversation tend to tell uh, uh, deeply abbreviated versions of our stories. When you're interviewing someone, you're not interested in the abbreviated version. And so you have to look for ways in which people are skipping ahead. So if I was interviewing you and you said, well, you know, uh, my, I came to uh, London as a 23 year old. And then he was, then I got a job. And I would say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What happened before you were 23? You know, yeah, yeah. normally in conversation, if you're meeting someone and having lunch with them, you might just use the shorthand version. They'll say, where are you, you know, how long have you been here? Oh, I got here at 23. That's fine for lunch. Yeah. It's not fine for an interview. You just stop the person and say, wait, where were you, you know, where did you go to? Where did you grow up? Where are your parents from? Where are you, you know, you have to get, start digging. And then even those answers will, Neat. you'll want to go back a, an, another layer, you know, you know, wait a minute. Why were you, a, why did you become a, you know, a, a champion sprinter at 14? I mean, why, how did that work? I mean, how, how good were you? Why didn't you keep sprinting? You know, like I can imagine you can just, you know, you, you start to uncover things. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of keep, peeling back the layer and be genuinely interested in the answer. Yeah, a, a sense of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. My, my favorite one was, I have a, a very good friend named Adam Grant, who's a um, very prominent psychologist. And we do these things from time to time, we sit down with, when he has a book comes out, I interview him. And when I have a book, he interviews me. And I was, we've been doing this for years. And I was talking to him once and I, he made some stray comment about diving. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'd known Adam for years. And I said, wait a minute, hold on, stop. Diving. First of all, Adam <laughs> is, a, is a short, um, physically unremarkable 
uh, you know, I don't know if they maybe she used the word nebbish. He's a nebbish. He's a bookish retiring. And all of a sudden he was talking about diving. I began asking him questions and I realized as a teenager, he was a nationally ranked uh, high diver. He, Impressive. He was, and then I went online and you can find YouTube videos from 20 years ago of Adam yeah. performing. He's unbelievable. And my understanding of him, I had thought he was this retiring bookish, you know, not very, someone who would shrink from any kind of athletic endeavor. Yeah, yeah. And I had him totally wrong. The man is a champion athlete. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that he has that side of his personality and chooses not to talk about it, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. Right? Now I have an insight into him that he's done something that most of us will be boasting about and he has hidden it for 20 years, right? Now, not for a terrible reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. What does it reveal? I probed, you know, we, that's what we talked about. And now every time I talk about him, I see him, I feel I see a much fuller Adam. I realize, oh, he's, this is someone of discipline, of he's competitive, he's disciplined, he's focused, he's, you know, he was a jock in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good example, but that, you know, you need to probe to find those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up to the first to the first question, which is, um, what are the best strategies for not judging people based on instinctive appearances? Are there any practical steps that you can suggest to remember the next time you meet someone new? Uh, well, on the, I mean, on the most basic level, it is to listen to your internal voice when you meet someone and every one of those judgments you make, slap them down. Yeah. So you meet someone and you're, you know, you know, your head is filled with boom, boom, boom. Oh, wow. Um, that person is, and then you fill in the blank, right? You have to learn to censor your own reactions and just say, you know, they, that person seems like they haven't had a bath in five days, but I don't know why. Right? Yeah. 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 Find out why before I jump to a conclusion. Maybe, you know, the electricity and the water's out in their house. Maybe they've been camping and they just got back. I don't know. I mean, there's a million reasons. Um, yeah. But, um, or uh, that person, uh, you know, I sent that person three emails and they haven't responded. Do they hate me? Are they angry at me? Are they lazy and bad at their job? I mean, or are, did someone in their family die? Uh, are they sick? You know, there's, there, you can't, if someone, I'm giving a dumb example, but someone doesn't return your email for three days, there are 10 or 20 possible reasons why. And the ones that we're drawn to tend to be ones that, about ourselves. This is some reflection on, on me, this person's responding. And most of the time it's not, you have to sort of, learn to wait before you kind of try and interpret people's behavior. You know, like when it comes to something like race and the centuries of conditioning, this isn't a question, this is, this is my own question, but the centuries of conditioning that have resulted in people making assumptions about race. Are there any techniques you can think of that people can use to kind of, to contest to contest that because you know, Fanon talks about the fact that we're not hardwired to make judgment, to not see, to, to judge people on their phenotype, but there have been centuries of social conditioning that have resulted in us doing that. Is there anything we yeah. can use to overcome that? Yeah, I mean, there's a good example. You know, there's a case that's in the news in the, in the United States from uh, of a, a young um, African-American man is going out for a run and uh, Aubrey. A, yes, the Aubrey case. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, suspicion that there was a burglar on the loose in the neighborhood. Two white guys see a black guy running, assume he's the burglar, and he and and Aubrey ends up dead. They end up shooting him. Um, that is, you know, that's a that's an extreme version of what we're talking about. They jump to a conclusion about a perfectly innocent man based on a stereotype. He's a young black man. The burglary was supposed to be done by a young black man. Bingo, that's the guy, right? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you fight against that? Well, one of the ways, this is, 
one of the major reasons why we, I mean, there are 10 things we should do about that, but why is it so important to have um, police forces which uh, represent the community they are protecting? That is to say, if your community is has a lot of African immigrants, you should have some African immigrants on your police force. Mm-hmm. Not just because that allows, that looks good, or that fits in Checking with some- a diversity box. Yeah. yeah. No, it's because, you know, the world is full of ambiguous situations and people who come from diverse backgrounds are gonna do a better job dealing with those kinds of ambiguities. If, a poli- if the police officer who got the report that there had been a young black man, you know, uh, suspected in a burglary, and if that police officer is black and they see Aubrey running along the road, it's good, it's, it's, it's good. they're gonna do a, I, I'm guessing on average, we'll do a much better job of understanding that, oh, this is just a young black man going for a run, yeah. right? They'll have some cultural context, some, and if they do stop him, maybe it's not as fraught an encounter. You know, maybe yeah. it's like, have you heard this? Or maybe the cop says, just so you know, there's a report of a burglary in the neighborhood. You're clearly a jogger, but there are some crazy people around here. Mm-hmm. Be a little careful. You know, who knows what the conversation is? The point is, it's a different conversation. It's a different conversation, yeah. So you, yeah. You know, that's why we need to pay attention to these kinds of things. We need to understand that the possibility for miscommunication is greater when there is cultural distance. Yeah, Thank And you. we need to shrink that cultural distance as much as possible. So I've got another question here. Do you think in these days of Zoom that we are now judging your bookcase or your room or the room that you're in as much as your hair, your teeth or your appearance, et cetera? <laughs> uh, well, you know, have I found myself doing that on my, the millions of Zoom calls I've been on a, a little bit? Not judging is too strong a word, but you're like, whoa, that person's in their bedroom or wow, like, you know, I'm more speculative about, because I'm, most people I'm talking to are in New York. Mm-hmm. Everyone in New York is, has tiny apartments. I'm always trying to figure out, where's the apartment? Like, I'm trying to look where up- Where do the, they live? Where do they live? <laughs> like, what? Or, um, but yes, it's a, there's a, uh, it's an unfortunate side effect of Zoom. I don't think it's a good thing that we get a window into people's um, private lives. Yeah, yeah unprecedented times right now. I have another question. Are we drawn to make judgments based on easily identifiable traits and are there evolutionary reasons? If so, how do we separate this from the morality of judgments based on categorizations like race and gender? Yeah, there's a set of, so I talk about this in talking to strangers. I have a whole, the first part of the book is all about what I call default to truth. And default to truth is an evolutionary notion. And that is that we have an over, we're hardwired to believe what other people are saying, um, to at least give the person we're talking to the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't sit here um, questioning the things that you have said to me. I accept them. I accept that you are who you are. You're an author. You live in London. You're, you know, you happily did this thing for Penguin. I'm not sitting here wondering, oh, is she, is she lying? Does she actually hate this? Is she actually a, you know, a, a lawyer who lives in Manchester and this is just a kind of an act? No, I don't think that. I believe you, right? <laughs> you no, know, we've never met. So there's a strong, and that explains part of our problem with strangers, dealing with strangers is from an evolutionary standpoint, we are, uh, the reason we evolved as a species is because there's enormous benefits in that kind of trust. Mm-hmm. That gets into, us into trouble in those occasional instances when the person we're dealing with is not trustworthy. What happens- So there are that, anomalies? The occasions when the person is not trustworthy is more of an anomaly. For, for the most part, people are, yeah, people are telling the truth. Yeah. And then we layer on top of that our particular cultural, racial, geographic biases. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why it's such a complicated stew because we have this mixture of, of credulousness and also- um, uh, our, each of us has our own little idiosyncratic sense of uh, 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 number of biases that we kind of use to tweak and twist and torque um, our impressions of others. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I find it really hard to talk to people, especially strangers. 
Oh, so relatable. Do you have any tips on overcoming this and getting over my nervousness and stuttering? I think a lot of people can relate to that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it is important to understand that most people are fundamentally well-meaning. Um, and that given an opportunity, people will judge you uh, for who you are, not how you present. You just have to make sure you give them that opportunity. So I think maybe it's about, um, the answer to the question, about trying to find situations where people do have more time to get to know you, um, where you're not on the, feel like you're um, on the spot, you know, where you're, um, where the, just where, there's, where people can get an, a much more sort of honest and full picture of who you are before they jump to a conclusion. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, it is a dumb example, but I'm a, member of a track club and we meet on you know wednesday nights it's like 40 of us and we're we're all runners and that's all we care about so everyone's all shapes and sizes all ages all backgrounds all i don't we didn't even ask about what people do for a living or nobody cares all they care is you they care that you like running and that mm -hmm. right and that's what we have and that allows that kind of by creating a community around a shared interest that allows us to put aside all of our, because I, everyone I see at that track practice is someone I know I have something very powerful in common with. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care about anything else, right? So communities um, of shared interest that cut across other identities and can be combined really, in that way. It, one, of the, one of the most troubling things about the world we live in is that those kinds of social encounters are, are there far fewer of them than there used to be. Mm -hmm. So we were talking 75 years ago, it would have been commonplace for all of us to belong to communities of shared interests, mm -hmm. you know, clubs of various kinds. That kind of, um, th that form of social interaction is on the decline. And that is enormously consequential. It's, that's a, it's a real shame because there was something incredibly liberating about those kinds of, um, those kinds of social groups. And do you, do you think we're becoming more divided in reified kind of identity groups? Maybe, I just want diversity. Mm -hmm. I don't mind if people are in rarefied identity groups, but I also want them to be in rarefied interest groups. Oh, re re reified, yeah, rather Rare. than re reified. <laughs> yes. I, I, I just want, I just think you should belong to um, a number of different social circles, each of which values you and sees you in a different way. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are an ardent feminist and every social group you belong to is passionately concerned about feminism, I think that's a problem. I think you should have one where people are only concerned about your interest in stamp collecting. Yeah. And where people with a shared interest is, I don't know, you know, pop music. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. I just think that as human beings, one way out of this box is to find ways in which we can represent our complexity easily to those around us. And not be reduced to kind of one dimensionality and a, yeah. diver a diversity in ideas. Thank yeah. you. I have one last question and then we're gonna wrap up. So in your episode around law school, you talk about tortoises and hares being better at different job roles. How do we mold our job roles to ensure we are making the best of our abilities? Yeah, so this is a reference to one of my podcast episodes in um, my podcast, Revisionist History from last year, where I was talking about um, how schools, I was talking about law schools, how they reward hares and not tortoises. They're set up to favor the people who can do tasks very, very quickly, as opposed to those who move slowly. And my point was that that's crazy because the law is actually a tortoise profession. It's a profession that favors people who move slowly. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, so why, why do law schools operate by a different system than the profession they are training people for? Yeah, yeah. Sense. Um, and so I, my, my, my guess is the person asking the question is a tortoise um, and wants to know why the world isn't set up for more tortoises. <laughs> I share there as a tortoise, I share that, uh, uh, that hope that one day the world will, um, but you know, all this entire time we've been talking, I've been talking about the values of the virtues of slowing down. Yeah. 
And that's what yeah. the tortoise does. The tortoise, tortoise takes her, tortoise takes her time. Um, and I, do I know how to slow down the world? No, not really. But um, if all of us join in and and say, hold up, <laughs> maybe we'll do. It. Maybe we can get we can get closer to that. So it's aspirational, at least, to slow down is something we should be as aspiring to. I'm in wholehearted agreement. We're going to have to wrap up there, but I want to extend a huge thank you to you for that conversation. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you are a student completing the activity sheet, the colour of the talk is lemon. Make sure you subscribe to the Penguin Platform channel for a book chat and giveaways for all Penguin's teen and young adult books. Finally, to receive a free audiobook download of Talking to Strangers, please fill, fill in the short feedback survey, the link for which is in the description below. Thank you so much, Malcolm, and thank you everyone for watching. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>